So as I said, today we're going we're gonna to try to get through uh, chapters 4 and 5 of the Sirens of Titan. And um, you know, we'll see how that goes. The fifth chapter is really short. There's not a lot that goes on, and it's a pretty disturbing chapter, actually. Uh, just a murder scene, basically. Um, pretty gruesome murder scene, also. Is that the fourth one? Yeah, the fourth chapter. Yeah, the ten, ten rentals or whatever. Yeah. Um, I'm so surprised they hadn't made a movie out of this, like, yet. They, they've tried. Uh, they were going to make one in the 70s, I think, and it just, they couldn't get enough money together. Uh, two years ago, or three years ago, the guy that does Rick and Morty, um, what's his name, Dan Harmon, got the rights to do it. And he was going to do it as a, as a, a series, like a whole 10 episode, like Amazon Prime was going to do it. And, and then I, there was like two or three articles about it. And I was kind of pissed because it's always been my lifelong dream to be a filmmaker and like I would make this movie. Like I have in my mind exactly how I would do it and everything. So I'm like, no, Dan Harmon. And I was like, well, at least if it's someone, it's gonna be the guy that did Rick and Morty. So it's gonna be kind of cool. He'll, he'll do it right or whatever. But um, yeah, I'm surprised. It's very cinematic, I think, kind of like it, for Vonnegut. His movies kind of suck though. Like they've done a lot of movies of his and they always kind of flop. Like. Um, what they did one on Slaughterhouse Five is actually a decent movie. It's hard to find. The Breakfast of Champions. It's only a good movie if you've read the book. Like if you've never read the book and you watch the movie, you wouldn't be able to follow it. You'd be like, "This is what the heck's going on? It doesn't make any sense." Um, it has Bruce Willis in it. I think he was like a huge Vonnegut fan. But it, I think it went straight straight to video too. Like it was like in the theaters for like two days. But. Yeah, but this would be, I think, it's very cinematic, right? But we did not finish um, chapter three. There is a scene in it that is kind of important, I would say, where, um, well, there's a couple scenes, I guess, right? Let me find the page number here. There's a couple scenes. So th there's, there's two characters who are very, I guess, minor that show up towards the end of chapter three. They're the ones that are waiting in the hotel bar. I can't even remember their name. Him Holtz, I think, was one of them. Um, they're waiting in the hotel bar for Malachi Constant. So remember, Malachi Constant has just lost his entire fortune. He's pretty much zero now. He shows up to Magnum Opus LTD, and his, you know, his his president is there to kind of just talk crap to him and tell him what an idiot he is and you know how he wasted his his father's fortune by, by being such a fool basically that's ransom k fern is the guy i'm talking of but he says you know your dad left a, a note for me he said he, he wrote a letter and he said that if this ever happened to give you this letter so he, he said and the letter is in the hotel the hotel room uh the famous hotel room that uh, Noel constant uh, made his fortune in right the hotel room that he never left once he started making all this money so and and, and ironically this is kind of funny they built the they built the headquarters for magnum opus ltd right across the street from the motel or hotel so all he has to do is walk across the street to like go to the room to, to pick up the letter and uh we learn about these two people in, in the in the in the bar who are these people are they him holtz i got right him holtz and wiley miss wiley and him how old German name. Helmholtz? Who are they? Where are they from? They're yeah, they're Martians. Okay. But you don't really, you don't understand what that means quite yet until like the next couple chapters. Because you're thinking like Martians? They're like aliens or whatever? No, they're humans that like move to Mars, right? <laughs> and they're a part of the Martian army, right? And they're there for Malachi. Right, they're there for him, right? And um, so I don't want to get too much into that scene. But they also show up at the end of the chapter. They also are at uh, 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 Beatrice's mansion, right? They kind of trick her into going to Mars, right? So I guess I guess Rumford did lie. He said that uh, they were going to go, you know, on this spaceship together, but it was sort of a trick. But anyways, um, I want to read the letter that um, Malachi Constant's father left for him. And in a way, and I was thinking about this over the weekend, maybe this, to me, this, this says a lot about the character of Malachi Constant. I, I think that him and his father have something in common, and, uh, and it's this. They both have 
what you might call, make sure the video is getting this. They have what you call, I would say, imposter syndrome. And I think there's a good reason for this, right? Um, who, who, who's ever heard of imposter syndrome? You heard of this? Yeah. Yeah, what is it? When you don't think you're good enough, you think like you're an imposter. Someone's like, right. oh, you're so good at this thing. And you're like, yeah. Like, they don't know like I don't deserve it, right? Mm -hmm. Like you just, you don't feel like you deserve what you have. Like you might be the boss or something. Like you're like really high up in your corporation. And you're like, why am I number one? Like, I'm not that smart. Like, do they know? Like, I don't, are they gonna find out that I'm like incompetent and don't know what the hell I'm talking about? Like, I think they both have this. Cause you, I remember like to back to the first chapter when I was reading this. In the first chapter when uh, Malachi confronts uh, Rumford, he's sort of, you can tell he's kind of intimidated by him. You know, he's like, this dude is actually really smart. Like this guy's actually classy and witty. Like he, he's rich for a reason. Like he, he kind of, he earned his wealth. Whereas like, I'm kind of just this sleazy, no good. Like I'm, my dad was rich, you know? I'm kind of like, so I'm thinking of like Wayne's world. We're not worthy. Right? It's sort of like that kind of thing. Um, for some reason, maybe it's because I was just talking about Rick and Morty. I was thinking of that episode. Of, if you see that episode of Rick and Morty where, uh, what's the dad's name? Um, Jerry or whatever. He thinks he's in, like, he's like in a simulation, but he doesn't know it. He like, everybody's there's like, yes, yes. Like they're like real fake. But he's like, oh cool, I'm number one. Like, like he, he never has that <laughs> like problem. <Yeah. laughs> But yeah, I think, again, like I'm gonna read the letter that, that his, his dad left for him. And I think that there's a bit of imposter syndrome in it as well. I don't know, maybe I'm reading into it. But so, so, he, so he goes into the motel, hotel room <clears throat> and he picks up this letter and this is what it says. Dear son, something big and bad has happened to you or you wouldn't be reading this letter. I'm writing this letter to tell you to calm down about the bad things and kind of look around and see if it's something good or something important anyway happened on account of we got so rich and then lost the boodle again. What I want you to try and find out is, is there anything special going on or is it all just as crazy as it looked to me? If I wasn't a very good father or a very good anything, that was because I was as good as dead for a long time before I died. Nobody loved me and I wasn't very good at anything. I, I couldn't find any hobbies that I liked. I was sick and tired of selling pots and pans and watching television, so I was as good as dead, and I was too far gone to ever come back. That's when I started the business with the Bible, and you know what happened after that. It looked as though somebody or something wanted me to own, my, to own the whole planet, even though I was as good as dead. I kept my eyes open for some kind of signal that would tell me what it was all about, but there wasn't any signal. I just went on getting richer and richer. Then your mother sent me that picture of you on the beach and the way you looked at me out of that picture made me think maybe you were all the big, all that the big money buildup was for. I decided I wouldn't, I would die without ever seeing any sense to it. Maybe you would be the one who would all of a sudden see everything clear as a bell. I tell you even a half dead man hates to be alive and not be able to see any sense to it. The reason I told Ransom K. Fern to give you this letter only if your luck turned bad is that nobody thinks or notices anything as long as his luck is good. Why should he? So have a look around for me, boy, and if you go broke and somebody comes along with a crazy proposition, my advice is to take it. You might just learn something when you're in a mood to learn something. The only thing I've ever learned was that some people are lucky and other people aren't. And not even a graduate of Harvard Business School can say why. Yours truly. Paul. All right, so this is kind of a weird letter, okay? It's pretty, that's a pretty sad letter, actually, right? You know, this guy's kind of like, I don't know what it's all about, right? Where's, what's the meaning? Like, I, 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 but he has this sort of hope that there's some meaning, okay? The world just seems nuts. This guy just made millions. He's the richest man on earth because he just randomly picked stocks out of a Bible based on the initials of the words, right? And he's just thinking, there's got to be something. Why? Why am I this lucky? And he, honestly, he's actually right. You're gonna find out at the very end of the book. I should warn you though, um, some people are gonna hate this book when they finish reading it. Um, a lot of people do this when they read Vonnegut. They're like really excited and then they read the last chapter and they're like, that was it? That was what it was about, right? So um, I gotta warn you, 
I, uh, there is a meaning, right? There is a purpose behind it all, but it might not satisfy your expectations, right? Uh, that might be a recurring theme throughout the book, right? That they have, you have these expectations that get built up and they're never really quite what you envision them to be, right? Uh, this is true, I think, of the sirens of Titan. Remember that picture that uh, uh, Malachi sees at the beginning of the three beautiful women? Yeah, when you find out what those are, you'll, you'll get a good chuckle, I guess. But anyway, there's something about Vonnegut in general, and I would say this is definitely true of this book, that's kind of anticlimactic, right? I'm trying to use literary terms here. Like, I'm not, not a literature professor, but right, if you're in your English class, oh, this is anticlimactic. What does that mean? I mean I'm kind of warning you, right? Yeah. I have a question. Yeah. Well, they're women, right? But they're sirens in the sense that they're like, they're tempting, uh, you know, they're drawing you in, I guess. They're metaphorically sirens. Yeah, yeah. What's anticlimactic? It doesn't build up to Yeah, well, it kind of builds up and then lets you down, right? It's sort of like, yeah, you know, like, oh, yeah, like all this, this like crazy thing's gonna happen. And then like, it's like, that's what it was all for. It kind of happens already at the beginning of the book. Once we get to like the chapter six and seven, you get to like the, the invasion of Earth from Mars. That's like, that's, yeah, that's kind of like, you're expecting this like crazy grandiose invasion. Yeah, don't, don't expect that. <laughs> yeah, it's not gonna be, it's not gonna be like some badass battle between Earth and the Martians, right? Uh, but yeah, I'm kind of giving it away, right? So he reads the letter and it's sort of like, he's like, you know, the letter basically says, hey, you're pretty much broke. That's the only reason that you're reading this letter. But that's good though, because you're down on your luck. And so maybe you'll learn something. Let me reread that. That's kind of a cool point he makes. I think that's pretty philosophical. Um, the reason I told Ransom K. Fern to give you this letter only if your luck turned bad is that nobody thinks or notices anything as long as his luck is good. Why should he? This reminds me, what is the name of that paradox? I think it's the, the, the it's not the lottery paradox, it's a different paradox. I think it's the winner fallacy or something like that. Um, a lot of people who are very successful don't realize how, how many breaks they got, you know what I mean? So they're just like, just work hard. I was successful. I'm like, yeah, but you're charismatic. You had, you know, this and that. You were like, a lot of it was luck. You know, like a lot of, I think there's a lot of people in Hollywood like this. You know, they're, I, I don't know why, but maybe it's because I've been reading uh, all the people hating on Arnold lately. But Arnold Schwarzenegger, like, I don't know if you heard about all the, he was talking about COVID and he said something like, school your freedom, well I'm at, you know, whatever. Like all these, all these gym bros are like, how dare Arnold say that, you know? So he's like in trouble. But I think Arnold is kind of like this because Arnold Schwarzenegger, you know, he came from this little village in Austria. You know, he, you know, he was a skinny kid when he was like a teenager. And then he like goes to the gym and just works hard and dedication and discipline and works his ass off, moves to the United States, takes all these risks, works hard. And now he's this multimillionaire, you know? So he's just like, I did it, you come too. You know, it's like, dude, you're Arnold, you know, you've got some charisma. You're, you know, he's a fun guy. He's a nice guy to be around. Like there's a lot of things I think he doesn't realize, like luck that he had that people could have followed that same formula. They could have been born in the same village in Austria, done the same thing you did, and failed at it, right? So there's a little bit of luck involved, I think. But I, you know, this, I think, makes people somewhat naive, right? And it's not that they're stupid, it's just because they don't realize the breaks they've had, that they just sort of take it for granted. And I think he's kind of saying, he's like, look, you wouldn't have been as interested. Like, I was already at the end of my rope, says this father, right? I was already, you know, as good as dead. And then this happened. So I figured, well, heck, there must be something I'm here for. So I'm gonna keep doing it. I don't know what it is, but I'm gonna keep doing it. So he'd already sort of gotten this point of desperation when he starts to worry about life. And now Malachi's in the same pulp uh, position, right? So he's like, you're not gonna take this deep question seriously. You're not gonna be like, well, what am I, you know, and, unless you're down in the dumps. This reminds me of a quote. I think I mentioned this like the first day of class, uh, Schopenhauer. Quote. It's not on that list I gave you, but it's something like um, Schopenhauer said that uh, moments of loss are the most important uh, because they, they reveal the true value of things. You know, when you lose everything, then you really know what it was. You know, when you have it, you just take it for granted, right? Your relationships with your friend and your family, you know, all these things. It's not until that is lost or is, you know, this also kind of, I guess, ties in a bit to Kierkegaard, you know, the night of faith and all that. You've got to go through this resignation. Abraham had to realize what he was losing in order to realize what he valued and that sort of thing. 
So I guess this is sort of somewhat of a recurring theme in the class, right? You know, it's only when your luck is down, that's how he puts it, when your luck is down, uh, when you start to notice things and you actually start to look around and question things. Um, but he also says, hey, something crazy might happen. Somebody offers you some crazy offer, just take it, that's my advice, right? And right after he reads the letter, what happens? He gets a crazy offer from, from who? Who? What's that? Yeah, the Martians, right? They, they walk in and what do they say? Let me find the, let me find this. He says, so Hemholtz and Miss Wiley let themselves in. They entered at precisely the right instant. So this is another thing he kind of makes clear throughout the chapter is that these people are on like a time clock. Like they know exactly when he's going to be there. They know exactly when he's going to read their letter. They know when he's going to be done reading the letter and when to walk in. It's like they, they know it all, right? They're, they're almost like, well, who's the guy Rumford at the beginning who has this sort of like, notion of time. They know what's going to happen before it happens. Maybe they've traveled through the uh, infundibulum. Miss Wiley removed her wig, revealing herself to be a scrawny man, and Hemholtz composed his features to reveal that he was fearless and used to command. Mr. Constance, said Helmholtz, I'm here to inform you that the planet Mars is not only populated, but populated by a large and efficient military and industrial society. It has been recruited from Earth, with the recruits being transferred to Mars by Flying Saucer. We are now prepared to offer you a direct lieutenant colonelcy in the Army of Mars. Your situation on Earth is hopeless. Your wife is a beast, right? He got married, remember, during that 59-day party to some woman he doesn't even know. You know. Your wife's a beast. Moreover, our intelligence informs us that here on Earth, you will not only be made penniless by civil suits, remember he's getting sued for those cigarettes, but that you will be imprisoned for criminal negligence as well. In addition to a pay scale and privileges well above those accorded lieutenant colonels in earthling armies, we can offer you immunity from all earthling legal harassment and an opportunity to see a new and interesting planet, an opportunity to think about your native planet from a fresh and beautifully detached viewpoint. If you accept the commission, says Miss Wiley, raise your left hand, repeat after me. And of course he takes the offer and goes up into space. Right, And then I'm going to skip the last scene of that chapter, but it's basically Beatrice getting fooled by these same agents, right? They're actually sipping champagne, I think, with her in the mansion. She thinks that they're a part of that, uh, the space company that owns the, the ship. And they're like, what was that metal thing in your yard that we saw on the way in? She's like, metal thing? There's no metal thing out there. Yeah, it's huge. It looks like a huge big old barn thing or like, what do they call it? Like a, like a mill silo or something. And she's like, what are you talking about? They go out there and it's this freaking spaceship. Well, he doesn't say that, but uh, yeah, it does. Flying saucer, she says, right? Um, so she goes up and she's gonna be on Mars as well. They kind of kidnap her, right? Malachi is a little bit more uh, voluntary, right? But you're gonna find out in the next few chapters. Well, I don't know, you don't really find out unless you kind of like read between the lines. What happens to Malachi? Is Malachi in, in the next two chapters? It's kind of a trick question. So tent rentals, and what's the other one? What's the name of this? The fifth chapter is tent rentals and... Uh, <clears throat> Yeah, letter from an unknown hero. Oh, that's right. Reading a letter from Stoney. Um, who's the main character in chapter four and five? What's the name of the guy? Uh -huh. Unk. Who is Unk? Did you figure that out? Uh -huh. It's him. Yeah, it's Malachi. Yeah. yeah. But he doesn't know it's him. Right? It's, it's hard to tell. The only reason you kind of know is because Boaz, right? Boaz says a few things, right, about him. You know, but who's Boaz? Or Boaz, I don't know how to say it right. Boaz is his, his sort of, his buddy. Well, his best friend is Stoney Stevenson. That's the guy that gets murdered. In, in, yeah, Stoney Stevenson is the one that gets strangled to death. And you don't really, this, this character is sort of, I think, symbolic or something. I don't know what it symbolizes. Maybe like, you know, he was my buddy kind of thing, you know. Um, but you don't really learn much about him. Like, you really, you learn about him through the letter that's read in the next chapter or whatever. But, like, he kind of recurs. I feel like it's kind of symbolic. Like, he lost all his memories and then he feels his best friend. Right. That his past has died with him. That's oh, that's, that's yeah. 
But he, I don't think he knew Stoney until he got to Mars, right? It's like, yeah, they get to Mars, they sort of realize they're both commanders kind of thing, or like they're, they're the real commanders, right? Because you, you think that, who's the guy? Brinkman, is that what the guy's name is? Brackman, Henry Brackman. Brackman is another real minor character, but Brackman is the one that, if you, when you read the, the rent a tent chapter, right, the tent rentals, Brackman is the one that orders Unk to strangle uh, Stoney Stevenson, right? So you're thinking Brackman's in charge. You're like, okay, so Brackman is like, Bo, uh, Unk, you know, go strangle uh, uh, Stoney Stevenson. So he's like chained up to this pole, right? And then he just strangles him to death. And then they like march on, you know? And then you find out that all the, 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 the snare drum is in their heads, right? Like all the, like that's all in their heads. It's not actually happening. Um, but you know, so you're thinking that this is the guy in charge, but you pretty soon find out he's not. How does that happen? There's this sort of, I guess they go back to the barrack and Boaz is kind of screwing with Unk. And that's the only clue you get because he says something to Unk. He says something like, you were once a really rich man. You were like the richest man on earth, you know? And you know a thing or two about Hollywood nightclubs. Hollywood nightclubs? My man is kind of failing me. I forget exactly what does he do to, to, to Unk. He screws with Unk and Unk has like a, a kind of a spasm. <clears throat> oh, he, uh, yeah, he asks him to remember something. That's right, because he's talking about your rich, think about it, think about it. And then he starts to think about it and he starts to feel a pain, right? He starts to feel a lot of pain in his mind, a sharp pain. So he, he kind of passes out for a second. And Brackman sees this and kind of chastises Boaz and says, hey, don't mess with him. I'm, you know, he starts to like say, I'm gonna give you like 10 days in uh, confinement or hard work. But then Boaz kind of like shows you who's really the boss, right? Because he sort of says, well, wait a minute. He starts to like mess with this little device in his pocket. He says, should I really be? He's like, oh, well, just a week. Really, a whole week? Well, just forget about it. You're, you're cool. You're cool, right? So it's obvious that, like, Boaz is sort of like the one who's really in charge of this platoon. You know, Brackman is the one that looks like the commander and it looks like he's making all the orders. But Boaz has this little device in his pocket, this little remote control. And anytime he wants to, like, make someone feel that pain in their head. Why does he feel pain with the memories, though, you think, Unk? What did they just do to him? They just basically erased all his memories, right? And they said that they had to do this like seven times. But I think this is Boaz says, usually you only have to do it once, but you got a memory, boy. Like you, you, you keep coming back and keep coming back and you, you, you're a strong one. You got these memories that just keep on the surface. They can't, you used to be a Lieutenant Colonel. That's another clue that it's Malachi. You were a Lieutenant Colonel. You were like me with your little remote control. You kind of, you weren't, you know, you weren't able to sort of follow the program and, and you got yourself in trouble, now you're just another foot soldier. That's why they call him Unk, I think, right? He says at the beginning that, you know, some older guy that used to be in charge, but maybe like they demoted him, they'll call him Gramps or Pops or Unk, like for uncle. So he's Malachi, this is Malachi, completely brainwashed, completely brain dead pretty much, right? In fact, he, he just has motor functions, right? It's like every time, and even then he has to, you know, relearn them. They say like, what do they say? He says they, they he kind of explains that they have to, only carve out certain parts of the brain. They can't carve the center out or, or something like that. And otherwise you're completely bad, you know? So they just, yeah, the cerebral cortex, you have to be sort of, can't mess with that, but you sort of scrape all the outside. And you've got a nice new brain that, to work with. But what's going on with Boaz? So Boaz actually has kind of paired up with Unk because he knows who Unk is. Let me find the, the passage I'm looking for. Because he's like, you're going to be my buddy, right? You're going to show me what's up. Um, I'm skipping chapter four because this not much happens in that chapter except for the murder of the guy, right? He gets strangled to death. I'm trying to find the passage where Unk and Boaz had their little back and forth. It's probably like 110 or 112 or something. 
Oh, that's right. Unk starts saying, Unk just says cell moon mist. That's another clue. It's Malachi, right? Cell moon mist. I guess that's one of his memories. Moon mist cigarettes that got him in so much trouble. And Unk says, or Boaz says, huh? What's that you say, Unk? So this is Boaz. Um, I'm going to skip to the next page because I know that's not what I'm looking for. Where is it at? Where he, he mentions the Hollywood nightclubs. Don't, this is the top of 110. Don't you remember Unk, said Boaz? Boaz, Unk. I'm Boaz. Unk nodded. How do you do? He said, oh, I don't do what you'd call, I don't do what you call real bad, said Boaz. He shook his head. You don't remember nothing about me, Unk? No, said Unk. His memory was nagging him a little, telling him that he might remember something about Boaz if he tried as hard as he could. He slushed his memory. Sorry, said Unk. My mind's a blank. You and me were buddies, said Boaz. Boaz and Unk. Um, said Unk. You remember what the buddy system is, Unk, said Boaz. No. Every man in every squad, said Boaz, he got a buddy. Buddies share the same foxhole. They stick right close to each other and attacks cover each other. One buddy, one buddy get in trouble in hand-to-hand. -hand. Other buddy come up and help slip a knife in. Um, said Unk. Funny, said Boaz, what a man will forget in the hospital and what he'll still remember. No matter what they do, you and me, we train as buddies for a whole year. You done forgot that. Then you say that thing about cigarettes. What kind of cigarettes, Unk? I, uh, uh forgot. Try and remember, and this is where he starts going nuts, right? Uh, you know, he gets this eerie feeling, the sharp pain, and you know, he starts to think about moon mist cigarettes. <clears throat> that wasn't the passion I was looking for, but yeah, so let's let's look. Where's the one where he start where he mentions the Hollywood nightclubs? Yeah, so he's saying, oh, I was just kidding, Sergeant, right? Boaz is starting to get in trouble from Sergeant. This is where we this is when you start to realize that Boaz is actually the one who's in control. Um Page 116. Wow, that's not 120. Thank you. Page 120. Yeah, kind of the middle. Um, in fact, let me back up a bit because that's where he starts talking about. He's try, he's telling Unk about who he was on Earth. Um, with the very bottom of uh, 119. Man, said Boaz, scowling at Unk, you are one of the luckiest men ever lived. Back there on Earth, man, you were king. Like most pieces of information on Mars, Boaz's pieces of information about Unk were underdeveloped. He could not say from where exactly the pieces had come. He had picked them out of the general background noises of army life. So I guess Boaz himself has been cleared a little bit too. He doesn't remember everything, but he kind of knows you're you're like Jeff Bezos, so you're you know you're rich. I know you're this famous dude from Earth that makes a lot of money. And he was too a good soldier, or sorry, he was too good a soldier to go around asking questions, trying to round out his knowledge. A soldier's knowledge wasn't supposed to be round. So that Boaz didn't really know anything about Unk, except that he had been very lucky once. He embroidered on this. I mean, said Boaz, there wasn't anything you couldn't have. There wasn't anything you couldn't do. There wasn't no place you couldn't go. And while Boaz stressed the marvel of Unk's good luck on Earth, he was expressing a deep concern for another marvel his superstitious conviction that his own luck on earth was, sh was sure to be rotten. Boaz now used three magical words that seemed to describe the maximum happiness a person could achieve on earth. Hollywood nightclubs. He'd never seen Hollywood, never seen a nightclub. Man, he said, you were in and out of Hollywood nightclubs all day and all night long. Man, said Boaz to uncomprehending Unc, you had everything a man needs to really lead himself a life on earth. And you know how to do it, too. Man, said Boaz to Unk, trying to conceal the pathetic formlessness of his aspirations. We're going to go into some fine places and order us up some fine things and circulate and carry on with some fine people and just generally have us a good whoop de doo He seized Unk's arm, rocked him. Buddies, that's us, buddy. Boy, we're gonna be famous. We're gonna be a famous pair, going everywhere, doing everything. Here comes lucky old Unc and his buddy Boaz, said Boaz, saying what he, he hoped earthlings would be saying after the conquest. There they go, happy as two birds. So what's what's this what's this dude up to? <laughs> what's he doing here? Right? So we've got this, we've got this this Martian army. 
We also learned that uh, Rumford is involved in all of this, right? So put his name up here on the board. Remember, Winston Niles Rumford, right, he's the guy that's stuck in the, uh, what the heck is that thing called? The, uh, <laughs> I, 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 I'm at a loss, the intergalactic, whatever, infundibula, chronosynclastic infundibula, right? He's the one that's stuck in there that keeps materializing on Earth every 59 days. He shows up on Mars, we find out, every 100 days, don't we? We learned that in uh, this chapter that every so often this man shows up with his dog and all the commanders kind of come together and he gives them sort of instruction. And so we got to imagine that Boaz is, is maybe not the highest up in the, in the Martian army, but he's high up enough to sort of know what's going on. He knows that they're about to go invade Earth. And what does he think is going to happen? He thinks that they're going to conquer Earth, right? The Martians are going to invade Earth and conquer it. And then what, 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 are, what are Boaz and Unk going to be doing? They'll be heroes, I guess. They'll be rich and they'll go to Hollywood nightclubs. What's he talking about? Hollywood nightclubs. Like, what, what is his aspiration in life? This is the aesthetic, right? This is like, this is like, why well, do you say go back to the old days? That's, that's kind of nostalgia. I think he's never been to a Hollywood nightclub. He's this, he's, he's a poor, you know, call him a color because this is written in 1959. I guess today called personal color or whatever. It's a black dude living in the 50s. And he's just like, you're a rich dude. You're rich. You go to these fancy bars, these fancy clubs with these pretty beautiful women and these fancy drinks and you know table service and so he, he's never been to that he doesn't know what that's like and he's just but for him that's that's the goal of life hollywood nightclubs that, that's his heaven that's nirvana that's and, and who's gonna shit he doesn't know how to do all that unk does unk used to be rich he, that, he used to do that all the time Remember, he was dating Miss Canal Zone or whatever the heck her name was, right? So I think Boaz is kind of like pairing up with, with Unk because he's thinking this is the dude that used to be a you know millionaire Bruce Wayne playboy. And so when we go to Earth, I'm going to be living my dream, right? So that's sort of his aspirations. You know, it's kind of the aspirations of like every teenage boy in America, pretty much, you know. I'm going to be a rock star or a famous rapper or whatever. Just go to club and be like every day clubbing and, you know, hot chicks, you know, twerking around me. You know, it's like, like he, that's, that's my goal, right? And this dude is going to be sort of my guide. Like he's dumb now, but I'll figure this out, right? Well, we'll, well I think that the, the, I don't think Boaz is. I think Boaz, to me, it seems like what Boaz is doing is he's trying to outsmart everybody. He's kind of like, well, okay, I'll be the commander and I'll have my little remote control so I don't have to worry about pain. Uh, and he'll probably even go along with the whole attack. But I think he's sort of like, he's looking out for himself, which I probably would too if I was raised in probably like he was and not many opportunities or whatever. He's just sort of like, look, how am I gonna, what am I going to get out of this? Like, so, okay, I'll be the commander. Let's get to Earth. Let's conquer. And then when we conquer, we'll be the rulers of Earth. And I'm going to finally get all the, 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 the prizes and the fun that I, I want. And, and, and this guy, you know, he's, he'll, he'll know, right? And, and we'll kind of, you know, once we get to Earth, we'll kind of sneak off and do our own thing. I think that's kind of what he's thinking, you know? It's like, once we get this conquering Earth business out of the way, I'll live the rest of my life going to Hollywood nightclubs, you know, and that's it. And, and to me, that's sort of like aspiring to the aesthetic, if you want to use like Kierkegaard terminology, right? It's all about fun and, you know, interesting, not boring, that kind of thing. Um, the, uh, the paper for this uh, that I want you to write for this book, I mean, you can, it, there's some people, I'm, I'm almost like sad because like some people that wrote their Kierkegaard paper, I wish they would have written a whole essay on just one of the things they said <laughs> instead of like answering two or three. I'm like, man, you should have expanded on that. Um, but this essay, I want you, and again, you can write on something else if you have an idea, but I, I was hoping that what you could do is pick a character or pick two and tell me which of the characters, and you won't be able to answer this until you finish the whole book because you don't really know the fate of the characters. Which, of, which character has the most meaningful life and which one has the least meaningful life. And I got into discussions with friends of mine who actually argue that Boaz ends up having the most meaningful life. I don't know. 
like, or he's the most content, but he doesn't end up in the Hollywood nightclub. You know, you'll find out. I think the next chapter, you get to find out what happens to good old uh, Boaz. But uh, it's kind of an interesting fate. But anyway, um, yeah, his, his aim, again, his goal is like, I'm, la I'm latching onto this rich dude. Once we get down back down to earth, we're gonna be living like kings. You know, we're gonna be living like pimping, whatever, you know, whatever, whatever sort of stereotype you wanna use. But um, <clears throat> there's something that Stoney Stevenson said to Unk. And even though Stoney Stevenson was like, also, you know, he had something in his brain that was painful too. He forced himself to say something to Unk as he, as Unk was murdering him. What did he tell, what did he tell Unk? He just a couple words. I don't even know the words. What did he say? Barrack 12, letter. Under the stone or something like that? Or does he say anything else? No. Oh, the blue stone. Blue stone, yeah. And so it takes a while, but, but Unk finally is like, okay, I think I need to go to this barrack 12 and figure out this, and find this letter. <clears throat> and so he reads this letter and it's pretty intense, right? You don't get the whole letter. This is a funny letter. It's, it's, it's all numbered. So it was obviously written over the course of a long period of time. He's able to sneak off, Unk is, and he, he was excited, though he didn't know why, he began to read by the light from a dusty window. Dear Unk, the letter began. Dear Unk, they aren't much, God knows, but here are the things I know for sure. And at the end, you will find a list of questions you should do your best to find answers to. The questions are important. I've thought harder about them than I have about the answers that I already have. That's the first thing I know for sure. And the list begins. One, if the questions don't make sense, neither will the answers. All the things that the writer knew for sure were numbered as though to emphasize the painful step-by-step -step nature of the game of finding things out for sure. There were 158 things the writer knew for sure. There had once been 185, but 17 had been crossed off. The second item was two, I am a thing called alive. The third was three, I am in a place called Mars. The fourth was four, I am in a part of a thing called an army. The fifth was five, the army plans to kill other things called alive in a place called Earth. Of the first 81 items, not one was crossed out, and in the first 81 items, the writer progressed to subtler and subtler matters, and mistakes grew more numerous. Boaz was explained and dismissed by the writer very early in the game. 46, watch out for Boaz, Unc. He's not what he seems. 47, Boaz has something in his right-hand pocket that hurts people in the head when they do something Boaz doesn't like. 48. Some other people have things that can hurt you in the head, too. You can't tell by looking who has one, so be sweet to everybody. 71. Unk, old friend, almost everything I know for sure has come from fighting the pain from my act, from my antenna, said the letter to Unk. Whenever I start to turn my head and look at something and the pain comes, I keep turning my head anyway because I know I'm going to see something I'm not supposed to see. Whenever I ask a question, the pain comes. I know I have asked a really good question when that happens. Then I break the question into little pieces and I ask the pieces of the questions. And then I get answers to the pieces and then I put all the answers together and get an answer to the big question. 72. The more pain I train myself to stand, the more I learn. You are afraid of pain now, Unc, but you won't learn anything if you don't invite the pain. And the more you learn, the gladder you will be to stand the pain. Now, this is literal, but it's kind of a cool metaphor, right? It's like, what's that? What is the bodybuilder? No pain, no gain, right? That kind of thing, right? <clears throat> uh, there in the furnace room of the empty barrack, uh, Unc laid the letter aside for a moment. He felt like crying. For the heroic writer's faith in Unk was misplaced. Unk knew he 
couldn't stand a fraction of the pain the writer had stood, couldn't possibly love knowledge that much. Even the little sample twinge they had given him in the hospital had been excruciating. He gulped air now, like a fish dying on a riverbank, remembering the big pain Boaz had slammed him with in the barrack. He would rather die than risk another pain like that. His eyes watered. If he tried to speak, he would have sobbed. Poor Unc didn't want any trouble from anybody ever again. Whatever information he gained from the letter, information gained by another man's heroism, he would avoid or use to avoid any more pain. Unc wondered if there were people who could stand more pain than others. He supposed this was the case. He supposed tearfully that he was especially sensitive in this regard. Without wishing the writer any harm, Unc wished the writer could feel just once the pains as Unc felt them. Then maybe the writer would address his letters to someone else. Unc had no way of judging the quality of the information contained in the letter. He accepted it all hungrily, uncritically. And in accepting it, Unc gained an understanding of life that was identical with the writer's understanding of life. Unc wolfed down on philosophy. And mixed in with the philosophy were gossip, history, astronomy, biology, theology, geography, psychology, medicine, and even a short story. Some random examples. Gossip, number 22. General Borders is drunk all the time. He's so drunk, he can't even tie his shoelaces so they'll stay tied. Officers are mixed up and unhappy as anybody. You used to be one, Unc, with a battalion of your own. History, number 26. Everybody on Mars came from Earth. They thought they would be better off on Mars. Nobody can remember what was so bad about Earth. Astronomy, number 11. Everything in the whole sky revolves around Mars once a day. <laughs> that's, like, that's like that Earth. We used to think that the Earth was in the center and everything revolved around us. Uh, biology, new people come out of women when men and women sleep together. <laughs> new people hardly ever come out of women on Mars because the men and women sleep in different places. Theology, somebody made everything for some reason. <laughs> Geography, Mars is round. The only city on it is called Phoebe. Nobody knows why it's called Phoebe. Psychology, Unk, the big trouble with dumb bastards is that they're too dumb to believe there's such a thing as being smart. Medicine. When they clean out a man's memory on this place called Mars, they don't really clean it completely. They just clean out the middle of it, sort of. They always leave a lot of stuff in the corners. There's a story around about how they tried cleaning out a few memories completely. The poor people who had that done to them couldn't walk, couldn't talk, couldn't do anything. The only thing anybody could think of to do with them was to housebreak them, teach them basic vocabulary of a thousand words, and give them jobs in military or industrial public relations. Kind of a bad joke there. Then there's a short story, which is actually kind of, this is sad, right? This is not really a story. This is actually what happened, I think, right? Unc, your best friend is Stoney Stevenson. Stoney's a big, happy, strong man, and he drinks a quart of whiskey a day. Stoney doesn't have an antenna in his head, and he can remember everything that's ever happened to him. He pretends to be an intelligence scout, but he's one of the real commanders. His radio, control, his radio controls a company of assault infantrymen who are going to attack a place on Earth called England. Stoney's from England. Stoney likes the Army of Mars because there's so much to laugh about. Stoney laughs all the time. He heard what an eight ball you were, Unc, so he came over to your barrack to have a look at you. He pretended he was a friend of yours so he could hear you talk. After a while, you got to trust him, Unc, and you told him some of your secret theories about what life on Mars was all about. Stoney tried to laugh, but then he realized that you had turned up some things that he didn't know anything about. He couldn't get over it, because he was supposed to know everything, and you weren't supposed to know anything. And then you told Stoney a lot of big questions you wanted answers, answered, and Stoney knew the answers to only about half of them. And Stoney went back to his barrack, and the questions he didn't know the answers to kept going around and around in his head. He couldn't sleep that night, even though he drank and drank and drank. He was catching on that somebody was using him, and he didn't have any idea who it was. He didn't even know why there had to be an army off Mars in the first place. He didn't even know why Mars was going to attack Earth. And the more he remembered about Earth, the more he realized that the army of Mars didn't have the chance of a snowball in hell. The big attack on Earth would be suicide for sure. Stoney wondered who he could talk to about this, 
there just wasn't anybody but you, Unc. So Stunny staggered out of bed about an hour before sunrise, and he sneaked in your barrack, Unc, and he woke you up. He told you everything about Mars that he knew. And he said that from now on, he would tell you every bloody thing you found out, and you were supposed to tell him every bloody thing you found out. And every so often, you two would get off somewhere and try to fit things together. And he gave you a bottle of whiskey, and you both drank from it. And Stoney said you were his best bloody friend. He said you were the only bloody friend he had ever had on Mars. Even though he laughed all the time and he cried and almost woke up people around your bunk, he told you to watch out for Boaz and then he went back to his barrack and slept like a baby. Um, who's writing this letter? We don't find out till the end of the chapter, right? Who wrote this letter? Unk wrote it. Right. It was kind of ironic. It kind of leads up to that because he's like, whoever wrote this letter is expecting too much out of me. I can't do this, right? I can't stand the pain. And then he's like, oh, I guess I can. I guess I have, right? Maybe that gives him a little bit more um, uh, confidence, you know, perhaps, right? Maybe not, <laughs> you know? But uh, <clears throat> yeah, and I'm going to skip a lot of the rest of the letter, but like the next part, it mentions again, it mentions... Uh, Niles Rumford, right? You know, this guy shows up every day with his dog, every hundred days with his dog. Um, you know, every time you guys find something new, you add it to this letter. Let's read, uh, starting at the 158. Oh, wait, no, let's do 157 because there's something important in 157 in the letter. This is on one page 131, but it's, it's item number 157 in the letter. Unk, you know why you keep going? Why you keep on going? You keep on going because you have a mate and a child. Almost nobody on Mars has either one. Your mate's name is B. She is an instructress at the Schliemann Breathing School in Phoebe. Your son's name is Crono. He lives in grade school in Phoebe. According to Stoney Stevenson, Crono is the best German bat ball player in the school. That's a game they invented on Mars, right? German bat ball. Like everyone else on Mars, B and Chrono have learned to get along all alone. They don't miss you, they never think of you, but you have to prove to them that they need you in the biggest way possible. 158, Unk, you crazy son of a bitch, I love you. I think you are the cat's pajamas. When you get this little family of yours together, swipe a spaceship and go flying away to somewhere peaceful and beautiful, some place where you don't have to take goofballs all the time to stay alive. These are pills they have to take so they can breathe on Mars, goofballs. Take Stoney with you, and when you get settled down, all you spend a lot of time trying to figure out why whoever made everything went and made it. You know, why, why are we here, and who did all this? All that remained for Unc to read of the letter was the signature. The signature was on a separate page. Before turning to the signature, Unc tried to imagine the character and the appearance of the writer. The writer was fearless. The writer was such a lover of truth that he would expose himself to any amount of pain in order to add to his store of truth. He was superior to Unk and Stoney. He watched and recorded their subversive activities with love, amusement, and detachment. Unk imagined the writer as being a marvelous old man with a white beard and the build of a blacksmith. Unk turned the page and read the signature. I remain faithfully yours, the sentiment expressed above this signature. The signature itself filled almost the whole page. It was three block letters, six inches high, two inches wide. The letters were executed clumsily with a smeary black kindergarten exuberance. The signature was Unk. It was, it was him. He was, he was the, the hero who had written the letter. When he got back to his barrack, jungle knives and bayonets were being honed with harsh grease scraws. Everyone was sharpening a blade. Everyone, everywhere were sheepish, sorry, and everywhere were sheepish smiles of peculiar sort. The smiles spoke of sheep who, under proper conditions, would commit murder gladly. Orders had just been received that the regiment was to proceed with all possible haste to its spaceship. The war with Earth had begun. So that's sort of how the chapter ends. We're going to find in the next couple chapters. Unk tries to convince his wife or his mate, as she's described here, his wife and his kid to escape with him, right? That's what happens in the next chapter. Things don't quite work out like they, you expect them to. And that, that you, should, you should sort of expect the unexpected with Vonnegut, obviously, right? Things aren't really going to work out. They kind of will. Like, what, where's he going to go? So, so he goes, 
Malachi, aka Unk, right? he was told. He was told by at the first chapter he was going to go where? Mars? So he's been there. Where next? What's that? Mercury? Then back to Earth? And then Saturn. Or Titan, actually. You know, the, the moon of Titan. So, yeah. How does he get to Mercury? We'll find that out next time. Um, I'm going to go ahead and cut it there because it's a good place to stop. Probably a little bit early, but what the heck? 30 minutes early, what the heck? No, we're, we're supposed to be done at 145, so 15 minutes early. It's not too bad. Um, for next time, for next class, it's the Zoom meeting. It's at 1 p.m. this week. Uh, if you can make it, please do. Read chapter six and seven. I'll post the recording of the meeting online when it's, when it's done. Um, but yeah, I think we'll probably finish this not next week, but I'm guessing probably week after next we'll be able to finish the whole book. So that's what I'm aiming for.